that's here this morning, each and every person that was instrumental, Lord, in this church getting its start, God, and continuing to uh, be a blessing in this community. And Father, we thank you for those people, Lord, and the vision that they had, Lord, and the, the closeness to you that they had, Lord, in their prayer life. And Father God, we pray, Lord, a special blessing upon them today. Lord, we ask that you would be with us today as we worship you. Father, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we're going to be careful to give you all praise, honor, and glory today. Father, we also ask today a special prayer, Lord, for those victims, Lord, in Uvalde, Texas, Lord, in that uh, shooting. Father, we pray that you would be with those families, that you would comfort them, God. Bring them peace today. And Lord, we also remember, Lord, today, as this is the weekend of Memorial Day. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the veterans, God, that paid the ultimate price, Lord, for our freedom, that we might be right here today worshiping you because, Lord, of the freedoms that they provided, Lord, when they fought for this country, the greatest country in the world. And Lord, we thank you for them. Lord, bless us this day, for we pray these things in that name that's above every name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Kyle, would you please come and share with us the history of the church? Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Back now. Well, you can follow along with me if you want to. This is the history of Oak Hill Baptist Church. <clears throat> As we celebrate our 72nd anniversary here at Oak Hill Baptist Church, we look back across the years to a group of far-sighted Christians who felt led of God to organize the lighthouse for home in the Oak Hill community. As best we've been able to determine, there were 17 children of God who were the charter members of Oak Hill. The Presbytery, headed by the Reverend H.T. McCarty, consisted of... <clears throat> Mrs. Mary Lee McCarty, Mr. and Mrs. O and Lillian Hammond, Mr. and Mrs. Roy and Mary Hattie Jones, Mr. and Mrs. John and Laura Lee Wise, 
Mrs. O'Neill Wise, Mr. and Mrs. E.H. and Thelma Smith, Mrs. Lily Moore, Ms. Mrs. Robert, D.C.A. Today, Mr. L.W. Shipp, Mr. Ernest Hamler, Mr. Clyde and Gladys Hamler, and Mr. Fred Malone. Most of the above names appear on either or both the charter dated 28 May 1950 and the resolution dated 21st May 1950. Others who were instrumental in the organization of Oak Hill, <clears throat> whose name is not listed as the charter members, signed the charter were Mr. D.C. Barnes, Mrs. Roy Lee, Mrs. Pearl McKenzie, Ms. Lois Smith, and Mrs. Marvin Nettie Hammer. Signed the resolution, Mrs. Marvin Hammer, Mrs. Pearl McKenzie, Ms. Lois Smith, Ms. Maggie Cheatham, and Mr. Ari Hammer Sr. There were many friends and children who first met in the home of the late Mr. and Mrs. O. Hammer until the time came to establish the sanctuary for God. We shall always be indebted to the people like Mr. and Mrs. Hammer who had a sincere interest in the work of our Lord to the extent they opened their home and worship services. In seeking a place to build, the late Mr. and Mrs. Ed and Rennie Hammer gave us their best, their fruit orchard, where the church auditorium now stands. Many other friends and loved ones gave us their means, either through money or personal effort, in building the sanctuary. Our prayer is that Oak Hill will always bring forth fruit of much more value and abundance than the fruit orchard that we give. The Christians of Oak Hill became an indivisible body, bound together by dedication to God and dreams of building an adequate place of worship. They saw the need for Sunday school rooms, an educational building with kitchen and facilities, and restaurants as they recognize the need for a mobile home to serve as a parsonage. In their determination, they have labored thus far and are still seeking God's guidance in determining the things to be done here at Oak Hill Baptist Church. We trust that your love for Christ will be deepened and that you will share our happiness in the services today. Please remember us in prayers and we invite you to visit us again. May God bless you and keep you in his great heart of love. Thank you. <laughs> Grab a hymn book and stand for an offertory hymn. We're going to see 410 in his well of my soul. We're going to sing the first, the third, and the last.
this time, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for the blessings that you bestow upon us day by day. Most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and what he means to us in our lives. Father, at this time in our service, we have a chance to give back uh, just a portion that we've been so richly blessed with. And may we do it with a cheerful heart. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
as I get older, I realize more and more every day that I'm nearer home than I was yesterday. The title of this song is A Nearer Home.
church. I was nothing but ears that day. snakes. <laughs> so, you know, I've been to many baptisms down there, but you felt like you needed the first aid kit. <laughs> I found a couple of songs, and I really like the Alan Jackson song, that is a very good song, so don't know it now. I'll play it if you thought it 
Rambo's. Uh, somebody might know something. I, I cut real short. And when I do, I don't mind doing a fast one since they've always done a fast one. <laughs> <laughs> might start out.
chapter 15, Luke 15. We're going to begin reading verse 11. You know, I, I appreciate Brother Josh mentioning it's Memorial Day. We're honoring not veterans, but those who pay the ultimate price. We honor veterans in November, and it's important to do that. But today we're remembering those who didn't get to come home those who paid the supreme price so that we could be here today and it's so important to remember them and have a special holiday. I read the last few days, this is the most expensive holiday of the year. Most expensive not in dollars and cents in the blood shed so that we can have this freedom. It's not about hot dogs and celebrations. It's about remembering those who made it possible. So I hope you will keep that in mind. But I'm glad it's homecoming. I want to share a homecoming message, a story about homecoming from the scripture in Luke 15, beginning in verse 11. Uh, if you want to look there with me, or if you'd rather just listen as I read from verse 11. The Bible says that he, Jesus, said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he'd spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. No one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish sure of hunger. I will rise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, and kill it. So let's eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this great story, for all the powerful meaning packed into this short story. God, I pray as we think about this, as we think about homecoming today, that God, you would speak to our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would just grab the attention of every person here today and hold it for these next few minutes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, our relationship to God could be characterized, it could be described as a story about coming back home, homecoming. You see, God created us for fellowship with Him. Sin messed that up. It started way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, went away from God, but God came after them. God made a way. God opened that door for not just them, but for all of us to come back to Him. And since that time, God's been building bridges. He's been going out looking for His lost sheep and bringing them back in. And if you could say with any degree of certainty today, I know that I've been genuinely born again. 
I know Jesus lives in my heart, been saved. Your story is basically what I just said. God created me in his image. Sin messed that up. I allowed sin to come into my life and messed up that relationship with God, and God came after me. I didn't go looking for God. I wasn't that smart. God had to come after me, but he did. And thank God he did. Now, the details are different for everybody's story. Yours is not exactly the same as the person sitting beside you, but it's the same story. It's the same basic plot. It's about homecoming. It's about coming back to God. And the good news is God made a way. God opened up that door, made a path for you to come back. Not just once. Because you see, once you came to God, you didn't stay on that path, the right path, all the time. None of us does. You strayed off that path, and God came looking for you again and brought you back onto that right path. Because that's what He graciously does for every one of us. You know, sometimes we get to a place in our life where we realize, you know, I'm, I'm not going the right direction here. I'm headed the wrong way. And when you do, you know, sometimes it can be embarrassing to have to stop and turn around. And of course, particularly so if you're a man, because, you know, men don't ask direction. <laughs> can I get a witness later? <laughs> Men don't ask directions, and it's embarrassing to stop and turn around and say, I've been going the wrong way here. But it doesn't get any easier. You know, if you go another mile down the wrong way, it doesn't get any easier if you go an extra mile in the wrong direction of God. Or if you go 10 miles, you realize, hey, I'm going the wrong way. It's not going to be any easier to turn around a mile down the road or 10 miles down the road. I had a preacher friend who used to say to me, son, if you got to eat humble pie, go ahead and eat it hot. It don't get any better cold. <laughs> he was right. I've eaten my share, and I think somebody else's as well. But I've eaten plenty of it, and I can testify. It, it, it doesn't get any better cold. you got to eat it. Go ahead and eat it hot. Mm -hmm. When we look back at this story, this wonderful story that Jesus told, Bad choices lead you away from God, lead you away from home. And I think everybody can identify with the young man in this story, the one we call the prodigal. Well, we've all made bad choices. We've all made those choices that led us away from God, away from where we need to be, away from where we really wanted to be. And not all bad choices are sinful, but all sinful choices are bad. They all take you in the wrong direction. They all take you down the dead end. You end up having to turn around. The struggle for all of us is, is sort of a double-edged sword. You see, the problem is Satan is a very good liar. He's got a lot of experience. And that's one side of that sword. The other side is this. You have a weakness. I have it. We all do. We want to believe those lies. We want to believe those lies that he tells us. And the weakness that we all have, it's not the same. Of course, some of we, we all are tempted, but in different ways. But we all want to believe the lies that he's so good about telling so, here's that double-edged sword. He's a great liar, the best that ever was. And we have this weakness for these lies that we want to believe them. Things like, it's, it's really not that bad. Everybody else is doing it. It's not really hurting anybody. 
son here felt like a prisoner in his own home. Some of you felt that way before. With all these rules got me tied up. I can't hardly move. I can't hardly breathe because of all of these rules. And Satan kept whispering in his ear, yeah, you're right. You can't breathe. You can't really live life. And essentially, what he said to his father was, I was really hoping you'd died by now, but since you didn't, let me just get whatever I'm going to get when you die. Let me get my inheritance now so I can go ahead and take off while I'm still young enough to live life and have some fun. Does that make you feel warm and fuzzy inside of parents? I was hoping you'd die by now, but you didn't. Since you aren't dead, let me just go ahead and get my inheritance now. 19-year-old Andrew Wamsley of Mansfield, Texas. Knew that feeling. Why he and his girlfriend enlisted a couple of others. Worked out a plot to kill Andrew's wealthy parents. Their plans were... Me and my girlfriend are going to kill my wealthy parents, which they did, by the way. We'll move into their big fancy house. I'll inherit their money. We'll live happily ever after. Didn't turn out that way, by the way. Never does. 17-year-old Michelle Hatcher, Orlando. Stole her mom's debit card, drew money out two different times to hire friends to kill her parents so she could be free. Thankfully, they didn't do it. They were just as dumb as her. They took the money, but didn't kill her parents, thankfully. You know, when I say that, don't think it's just young people that do stupid things like that. It's not. It's not just teenagers. It's not just young people. We read it all the time. We hear it in the news. People who are mature adults. People who live their lives. A couple of weeks ago, we read about, heard about a woman in Alabama working in the sheriff's department, ready to retire. Helped a convict, a man accused of murder, to escape, and she escaped with him. Went on the run, and you think, come on, lady. She's dead. He's still alive, by the way. We look at that, and we think, how is it that Satan's able to draw these people in? He's a very, very good liar. And you have a weakness. I have a weakness. It makes us want to believe those lies that he tells. And it's sad. Because those lies always lead you away from God, away from home. And it's a path we want to come back to. You always will. You see... This young man in the story recognized failure. Came to realize the blessings of home. I love the wording of verse 17 where it says, but when he came to himself, that's, if we want to put that in modern vernacular, it's a way of saying when he hit rock bottom, well, that's what happened. He bottomed down. He was sitting there one day in the pig pen 
looking around and he did an assessment, he thought, hey, what am I doing here? I'm nobody here. You know, that prison house that I left to come here to be free, back home, I was somebody. I was a rich man somewhere. Here, I'm nobody. Nobody here cares whether I will live or die. Nobody cares that I'm hungry. Back there, I had nice clothes. Now I got rags covered in dirt and mud and stink. Had all the food I wanted, good food. Now I don't even have any food. Pigs are eating better than me. Don't have any friends, no family here. Got nothing. By the way, in Jewish culture, keeping pigs was as low as you can get. I mean, that's that's as low as it goes. Pigs were unclean animals, you know that. And taking care of them, by the way, the Jews didn't eat them. Taking care of them, that was that was the lowest job that there was. He couldn't go any lower than that. That's what he was doing. When he woke up, what was going on? You know, Will Rogers, humorous from many years ago, said there are three kinds of men. The ones that learn by reading, the few who learn by observation, he says the rest of them have to pee on the electric fence for themselves. <laughs> He's right. So maybe that's a chuckle of remembrance. It's a sad situation when a person wakes up and says, Man, I've been had. I've been led down the wrong road. I've been taken advantage of. And let me tell you, every one of us, the devil has done that to you. He's taken you down that wrong road away from home, away from this place that you love. And I love away from a place that cares about you, away from people who care about you. He's taking you down that road. When that happens, it's decision time. What do you do? You just hang around there at the hog pen, fake it until you can make it, live with the shame, or do you get up Go back. You have to decide. See, well, it, the story is he went back. That's Jesus' story. Not everybody does. You know, I wish we could say that everybody's story is everybody comes to themselves and they realize, hey, the devil did a number on me. I got to go back. Not everybody does. I wish they did. The prodigal was glad he had a home to go back to. But he wasn't excited about facing dad. He wouldn't have been either. He had a good dad, did he? He had a wonderful, loving father. And you know the rest of this story, but he didn't know it. When he got up out of that hog pen and started toward home, he was a broken young man. Broke, didn't have any money. Broken, stinky, dirty. Hat in hand, head down. This ain't going to be a fun meeting. Love my dad. Pretty sure he used to love me. I hope he still does. This ain't gonna be fun. 
He had his little speech ready. I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. He's right about that. I ain't saying I deserve another chance to be your son. You'll just hire me to be one of your servants. That'll be good enough for me. We've all been there. You know, back in 1973, Tony Orlando and Dawn recorded a song, <coughs> Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. Great song. Some of you are old enough to remember it. You love that song. Everybody did. It was wildly popular. What you might not know about that song is the two guys who wrote that song thought when they wrote it, this is a great song. We, this is going to be something good. And they were experienced songwriters. They took it to New York to some of their music publishers and they got thumbs down to everybody they talked to. They said, Sis, take this junk. Go write a good song and bring it back to us. This song about being on the bus and tying yellow ribbons to a tree. Come on, man. You guys are better than this. They said, well, We think it's a good song. They finally found a publisher who had published it. He said, I got the I got the folks to sing. Tony. Tony Orlando. He did sing. When they started putting it out on the radio in New York, it burned up the switchboard at the radio station trying to take the calls. The disc jockey finally had to say, please don't don't anybody else call. He burned up our switchboard. We can't take any more calls, requests for this song. The reason was this song touched the chord deep inside some people. Everybody was thinking, I've been on that bus. I was that guy sitting there hoping there'd be another chance for me. But I didn't know. I didn't know if there would be or not. I sure wanted there to be. I was hoping. <coughs> I didn't know. This young man, this prodigal, was thinking, I didn't know. Hope. I hope it will be. Here's a wonderful thing. His father welcomed him back. You see, here's the wonderful news about this story. His father didn't just take him back in. His father was looking for him. Every day, he was standing there looking down the road. One day, he's looking down that road. He said, that, you see that young man coming? Walk. He looks familiar. Something about that young man, I, he's too far off to tell, but he looks familiar. He got a little closer. He said, you know, I think that's my son. I think he did that. Then his father did something that men in that culture never did. Never. He ran. Well, men run. Not in that culture, they didn't. He never ran. That was considered undignified. He ran to meet his son. This son started his speech, I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Dad, stop him. I didn't know if you were dead or alive. What did he phone to pick up and call Dad and say I'm coming home? What did he way to write a letter? What did he news he'd been in a far country? He didn't know. He said, this is my son. He was dead, but now he's alive. We have to celebrate. Put some clean clothes on him. Put a ring on his finger. Kill that fatted calf that we've been saving for a big celebration. It's time to be happy for a party. 
Let me tell you one last lie that Satan tells before I wrap this up. Sometimes people come to the place where this prodigal son was, and Satan tells them this lie. You can't go back home. Too much water's passed under that bridge. You're going too far. You're too far from home. You messed up too bad. There's no place at the table for you now. They didn't hear me. That's a lie. That's wrong. That's the voice of Satan. This story and others confirm the truth that God's arms are open. He'll take you back. You can come back home. It doesn't matter how far you went in the wrong direction. It doesn't matter how many times you went down the wrong road. You can come back. And he'll meet you. you know, I've heard preachers say, look, you just turn around and go back where you came from. No, that's not right. You just turn around. He'll meet you on the road. You hear me, church? And turn around. You head back in the right direction. You don't have to get back to where you came from. He'll meet you on the road. He'll take you in. Would you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed and every eye closed. It's about homecoming today. It's about coming home out to Oak Hill. Coming back to God. Coming home and finding God's arms open wide for you. Some of you may have drifted away. Some of you may have never really put your trust in Jesus Christ. Today's the day. Today's the time when his arms are open wide for you. If you'll come. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. It's God's invitation to you. The pastor will be here at the front to receive you, to pray with you, to help you find peace with God. Would you do what God wants you to do? Heavenly Father, I pray right now you give folks the courage to step forward and make their decision for you. Right now, I pray this in Jesus' name. Would you stand? <coughs> Three forty two as we sing, would you be the first to step out of time right now? <laughs>
Uh, Brother Shad, you want to come and lead us in a couple more little songs here? Just to let everybody kind of know that I'm all laughing behind that bag. I challenged her about two months ago. So I let there's a time I get up there to never be a devil egg. Everybody in their turn needs to make devil eggs. Joanne made 250 eggs. I mean, it was like, by the time we got up there, it was like a table just for devil eggs. I'm not going to do that. Uh, if you'd like to stand and sing, you can. If not, just uh, you can sit right there. We're going to turn to 138 at Calvary. We'll just sing the first and the last. Uh, we're just going to sing a couple of songs while they're preparing. If you'd like to stand, you can. If not, you can stay seated. 138.
Lord. Thank you for giving much thanks, Lord, for allowing all of us to be here and worship you today, Lord. And uh, return home, Lord, to our roots, our, our wonderful church family here, Lord. Uh, I ask you, Lord, to also bless these good groceries that's been prepared for us over here. Uh, I ask, Lord, that, that you be with those that could be here today. Lift them up in your spirit, Lord. Follow us all to our homes safely today, Lord, as we are speaking for worship and fellowship in your name, Lord. Jesus, name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.